If you're not familiar with the Lion King story, the older lion, Scar, was jealous of his brother who was the rightful king. Scar wanted that position for himself. And as a result, he wanted to kill the king's son because he believed that he would then gain the kingdom for himself. The thing is, Scar was not nearly powerful enough for a face-to-face confrontation with the king. So to get to the king, Scar decided to try to take out his heir. He used deception. And his method of deception was by implanting a thought. He would feign surprise that Simba had not heard about this dangerous place in an effort knowing that Simba's, his curiosity would get the best of him and would lead him to go there where he had a plan in place, where he would set a trap to kill the young lion. Because that's where Scar's power lied. It wasn't in anything that he could do. It was simply in the messages that he could portray. This morning, Scar offers us a very good picture of who Satan is. Satan, too, wanted God's position and authority for himself. He, too, was no match for God's strength or God's might. So, he went about destroying the heirs of God's kingdom, humanity. Satan's true power lies in his ability to affect our minds, the power of insinuation, the power of suggestion, the power of deceit. He uses these things to lie to us and to get us into situations, to get us into circumstances that will ultimately lead to our destruction. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So the reality of it is this morning, we do have an enemy. And this enemy is trying to take us out because he believes that if he can take us out, he can somehow have reign and power for himself. And is, he's angry. Because at some point, now we're not exactly sure of when this all went down scripturally, but we do know that the angel Lucifer, who was an an immensely powerful figure, the angel Lucifer got a third of the angels in heaven to go into a rebellion against God, believing that they could usurp God's authority and power and take the kingdom of God for themselves. Well, they were absolutely no match for God, so God cast them out of heaven, and he sent them to earth. Lucifer and a third of his angels. Lucifer's name was changed, and we now know him as Satan, the deceiver, the accuser. We also call him the devil. And now Satan occupies this space that we call earth, and his number one agenda is to take us out, to convince us to rebel against God and to sin so that we will be separated from God for eternity. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we we see how all of this got started with the first human being. It says, Now the serpent, talking about Satan, was more crafty, more cunning, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Eve, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Now, if you're familiar with this story at all, or if you've read the first few chapters of Genesis, you know that God did give Adam and Eve a directive. He told Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree in the garden. Any tree. You can have all of them. In fact, there's a special tree in the middle called the tree of life. You can even have the tree of life but I don't want you to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not ready for it yet. It's not going to be good for you. Don't eat it. But you can have everything else, even the tree of life. Just don't eat this. But you can have everything else. Just don't eat this. You guys see what I'm saying? So what does Satan do? Satan comes in, and he focuses on the one thing that they can't have. Because this is how he works. 
This is how he gets to us. Satan, our, point, our first point this morning, Satan will try to get you to question God's goodness. This is how he's going to start every single time to take your life off track is by questioning God's goodness in your life. And the way that he does this is he took the focus off of all of the good that God had offered and given to them and he implied that God was keeping something from them. He had given them access to the tree of life. This was immortality. If they ate of this tree, they got to live forever. They got to be in perfect health and a perfect paradise. They literally had everything. And yet Satan said, can you believe it? I can't believe it. I'm stunned, Eve. I, I cannot believe God told you, you cannot eat from any tree in the garden. You see how he's twisting that? No, God said you can eat of any tree except this one. But Satan poses it like they can't eat of anything, like God's trying to withhold from them, like God's trying to hide something from them. Because there's something within us human beings, there's something in our makeup and our wiring that makes us really curious. And we always want the thing that we're not supposed to have. We use phrases like, the grass is greener, on the other side of the fence. Or we convince ourselves that that man or that woman would make us happier than our spouse. Or we convince ourselves that that job would be better. Or that house with its layout of its kitchen and the way that it has that extra bathroom, it would be so much better than what I have. Or that church over there is offering those programs that I want. Or this or this. We always want something else. Satan gets them focused on the negative instead of the positive, when in reality it wasn't even a negative. God was trying to protect them. God was trying to keep them safe, but Satan wanted them to die. He twisted the truth, and he planted seeds of doubt. See, that's how it gets started. When the seeds of doubt start getting planted in our minds, all of a sudden we will water those bad boys all day long. And you know how you water seeds of doubt? By thinking about it, and thinking about it, and thinking about it, and thinking about it. This is Satan's playground right here. This space between your ears, your mind is Satan's playground. It's the only place that he actually has any power whatsoever in your life. He can't take you out any other way but to mess with your mind. We can't actually say as as Christians, Satan made me do it. The devil didn't make you do anything. He just offered a really dumb suggestion and you bought into it. He offered you the lure and you bit in and it got you by the hook and it, then he just drug you to shore. But the hook, the lure, is doubt. When we start thinking questions to ourselves, when we start asking things like, you know, God, where, where are you? Why me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. I, I, I'm better than they are. I'm better than they are. I work harder than they do. Why, why didn't I get that promotion? Why haven't I gotten married yet? Why didn't I get a new car? Why, 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 why? God doesn't care about me. And we start entertaining these thoughts and we start watering these seeds and it grows into this very, very unhealthy vine that sucks the life out of us. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, you were running so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, Paul was asking the Galatians, how in the world did you go from serving Jesus, doing the things that God was telling you to do, beginning to have prosperity, beginning to have joy, beginning to have peace, getting out of the hole that you had dug for yourself. You were beginning to see the light of day, and now you've bought back into those things. How did you get here? How did you allow yourself to go back into the mess? Who hindered you? Well, you know who hindered you? You did. It's nobody else's fault but ours. People can do things to us. No one can force us to make a decision. Satan can put the idea out there, but it is our choice, our willful decision to buy into it. A little leaven leavens the whole bunch. Now, 
I'm not a baker, especially of bread. I don't eat bread anymore, so I don't want to touch it because it smells too good. But from what I understand is that you can take a tiny little bit of this stuff called leaven and you can put it into this whole big lump of bread and that tiny little amount will mix throughout the whole thing and cause the entire thing to rise. What Paul is warning of us here is that you can take a little bit of doubt and put it into your entire life, and it'll rise up and mess up the entire thing. What starts off as a simple, tiny suggestion can end up ruining everything God has started in your life. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, No, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it unless you want to die. Do you notice what happens here? Eve adds to God's word. Because God said to her, you can eat of anything, any tree that you want, even the tree of life. But there is a tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that one. And so Eve hears that and she's like, okay, what's good and evil? I don't know what good and evil is. I, I wonder if it's fun. I wonder if it's something that I would enjoy. Why is God trying to keep good and evil from me? I don't get it. Why in the world would God not want me to experience it? How can I be a fully realized human being unless I've experienced good and evil? I, I think I should try it. And see, we do this all the time. We do this with crazy, stupid stuff. And one of the things that breaks my heart is when I hear people say this, and, and maybe you've said it, and I'm not trying to condemn you or call you stupid. I'm just saying what you said was stupid, okay? We say things like, well, you know, I don't really regret my past because it made me who I am today. Really? Are you going to walk up to a, to a young mother whose child just died and said, you know, I'm kind of glad your child died. Because it helped make you stronger. You going to say that to somebody? No, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Like, you know, I'm really glad that you got raped. Because it helped you to become, I know, that's, we should. Oh, I can't believe somebody would say that. But yet we will say to God, I'm actually glad that I sinned against you. I'm glad that I nailed Jesus to the cross. Because it's made me who I am today. You don't have to experience sin to know to stay away from it. I don't have to put my hand in the fire and get third degree burns to know that I would be better off not to do it. Thankfully, I've had people in my life that have said, I burn myself, don't do that, it will hurt. Thankfully, we have a loving father who says, don't do these things because if you do them, it will hurt you. Yes, God can rebuild you, but you don't have to go through the pain, you don't have to waste the years of your life. You don't have to keep going around the mountain before you figure it out. We don't have to sin to know that it's not good. So we need to stop buying into this idea that we need to experience everything so that we can understand everything. That's from Satan. That kind of desire is from the enemy. He wants you to buy into that God is trying to hold something from you. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found out to be a liar. You know what adding to God's word is called? Religion. When we begin to add to God's word, we leave relationship, which is all about our good, which is all about building us up in our faith, and we enter this into this man-made thing called religion. How many of you have experienced religion before? Yeah, it's the reason most people leave church. It's the reason most people want nothing to do with God, because religion says, here's all of these hoops that you have to jump through. Now, I'm not going to jump through them, but I'm going to want you to jump through them, and I'm going to judge you for not jumping through them, and I'm going to think I'm better than you when you can't jump through them, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to be a hypocrite. See, that's what religion does. Relationship says, I love you. Don't do that. I don't want to see you get hurt. Do these things, because I want to see you be blessed, and it's out of a place of relationship. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 says, I am astonished how quickly 
Some of you are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That word in the Greek means damned. It means let them go to hell. Paul is saying this is not okay. If you are telling people a different gospel other than the one that they have first received, that is not okay. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel different to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul repeats himself. He's that serious. You know what this is talking about? When we buy into the reality of God, there is nothing better when we get to that place in life where we realize that Jesus really is who he claims to be. And we begin to follow Jesus and we begin to do the things of Jesus and we begin to put it into practice in our lives. Anybody in here had their life made completely better by following Jesus? I'm not saying easier. It's not easier to follow Jesus. In fact, it's often much more difficult in certain situations. But it's better. God's way is always the best way. Your marriage, your life, your children, your work, your hobbies, it all gets enhanced by the power and presence of Jesus Christ when we do things God's way. But sometimes we go back to the old way. Sometimes we go back to doing things a different way. Or we hear someone come along and they're like, you know, it's okay to do that, but it's okay to have a little bit of this as well. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. Let's, let's, let's just be honest with ourselves. Nobody's perfect. So go to church and read your Bible and, and do all this stuff, but, but come on, come out with me on Friday night. And you know what? God will forgive you, right? God will forgive you if you just make a little bit of a mistake. Who cares if that relationship isn't really godly? God will forgive you. You know what? Your intentions are good. You're working towards something. So when you get there, God will forgive you. Or who cares if you cheat just a little bit? Who cares if you lie just a little bit? Who cares if you take just a little bit more for yourself than what you need and you spend a little bit more on yourself than you need? Who cares? God will forgive you. It's okay. And we buy into these lies. We buy into this and we begin to live and believe a different gospel. We begin to believe things about God that are not true. That's what Satan wants. Our second point this morning is that Satan will use what you don't understand against you. Adam and Eve didn't understand what good and evil were. They also didn't understand the punishment, which was death. So when God said, you will surely die, they're like, all right. I don't know what that means. I'm not very afraid of that, right? I I don't know what death looks like. There was not death before sin. And so they just kind of walked around with this attitude of, I know I shouldn't, but I don't really understand the consequence, so let's try it. Genesis 3, 4 through 5 continues. It says, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Gosh, God is such a spoil sport, such a warrior. You're not going to die. In fact, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. The desire to be our own God is at the root and core of every sinful decision, every act of rebellion we will ever commit. It's the belief that I actually know better than God does. Now, we would never say that out loud, but our actions speak louder than words. When I do things my way, contrary to God's way, I'm saying I should be God. And you know whose example we're following when we do that? We're following Satan. In Isaiah 14, 14, it gives us the words of Satan before his fall. Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now, most of us would never consider saying that to anybody or or actually thinking it to ourselves. But the reality of it is, we do this on a daily basis. When we break God's commands, when we go against God's laws, when we do things contrary to the gospel that we've already received, 
We are saying, I am my own God, and I can handle it. I can take care of it. God, you know what? It's been fun with you at the steering wheel. I've enjoyed the blessing. I've enjoyed the peace. I've enjoyed the hope. But you know what? That relationship that I'm wanting, that godly marriage relationship that I've been wanting, it's not getting here fast enough. So you get in the side, you get in the passenger seat. I'm going to drive for a little bit. And I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to jump into this relationship. We're going to move in and I'm going to do everything I can in my power to make this marriage happen. Even though that other person has no intention of marrying me, I'm going to convince myself that it's okay because God, you're trying to make it work. Too close to home? A little too close? Or for me, you know, God, I work hard. I serve you. I've given my life to ministry. I think you owe me. I think you owe me, God. I think I should be able to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. And it's okay if I weigh over 300 pounds. It's okay if I'm unhealthy. It's okay if I'm destroying my body. Because, God, I'm doing all these other things right. I I deserve this. Just give me this one. Just this one area, God. And we all have, like, our one area that we're just like, okay, God, you can have all the rest, but I'm going to keep this one back. And what we're saying is, I should be God. I want to show you another clip real quick. Check this out. This is the spirit that's at work in this world. This is the spirit that seeks to be at work in our lives. This spirit that recognizes that it is no match for the almighty power of God, but believes that it is enlightened, believes that it is more intelligent, believes that it is the rightful ruler of all things. It is a spirit of pride. It is a spirit of ego. It is a spirit of intellectualism. It is a spirit that will convince and seek to convince that we should be God. In Genesis 3, 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Our third point this morning is that Satan's seeds will produce death if allowed to grow. The seeds of doubt, the seeds of twisting God's word that Satan seeks to put into our lives will lead to death. They will produce death, death to the things of God, death to to the plans of God, death to the desires of God in our lives and for our lives if we allow them to continue to grow. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 
Let no one say when tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, for he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and he is enticed by his own desire. Say own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. See, this is how it works. Satan goes after our weaknesses. He seeks to exploit the things that we don't understand, and he comes at us with this spirit of superiority, with this spirit of intellectualism, with this spirit of pride and ego, and he begins to drop these seeds of doubt, these questions. He begins to twist God's word. You shall not surely die. Well, you know what? He was right. Adam and Eve did not drop dead physically the moment they ate the fruit. But what happened was the moment they sinned, they were separated from God and their spirit died. And then 800 years later, They died physically. Satan will twist God's word and he will make you believe that just because the ramifications and the consequences are not immediate, that you don't have to be concerned. Or just because you can't see them or feel them doesn't mean that they're actually taking place. Every time we choose to be our own God, something inside of us dies. Something inside of us is torn from the presence of God. There's a reason that Adam and Eve had to put on loincloths. It's because they were now aware of their own nakedness. You know what experience with evil does for you? It makes you feel guilty. It makes you feel exploited. It makes you feel shameful and dirty and gross. Experience with sin will never make you better. It will never make you stronger. It will never make you healthier. All it will do is make you hide from the presence of God. So what happens is then, according to our desires in these areas of weakness, Satan will put in these seeds. And then when we think about them, and we think about them, and we think about them, and we allow ourselves to contemplate these things and we allow ourselves hear me say the word allow because you and i are the ones who allow these thoughts to persist and to continue when we allow these things then we give in to the sin the behavior or the mindset or the words spoken or whatever that sinful behavior activity might be it 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 happens in our life and then what happens we feel guilty we feel ashamed, we hide from God, and that sin persists. If we did it that one time, well, you know what? I didn't die, so I can do it again. Hey, I didn't die, I can do it again. I didn't die, so I can do it again. And all of a sudden, it snowballs, and it gets out of control. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves 417 pounds standing on the scale at the doctor's office going, what? My story. What? How? Like yesterday, I had abs and I was playing football and now I'm dying, literally dying, heart failure, heart whatever. I've got a future doctor. I'm not saying any of the words because you'll make fun of me. (laughs) How did I get here? And the answer is very simple. I listened to the enemy. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father. It is from the world. All of this stuff out there that's calling to me and trying to draw me away from God, trying to get me to believe that there's a a way that I'm going to be happier. You know what happiness actually means? It means happy for about 5.3 seconds and then miserable for the rest of the time. Joy comes from God. Joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Joy transcends situation. Joy transcends circumstance. It is not immediate gratification. It is eternal gratification. Joy comes from the Lord. Happiness is a lie from Satan. But how many times do you hear people say, how many times have the words come out of your mouth, I just want to be happy. And what you mean by that is I just want to feel good for a second. And I'll deal with the consequences afterwards, no matter how bad they are. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 gives us an answer to all this. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. If you are in Jesus this morning, you have the mind of Christ. And you no longer have to listen to the deceit and to the lies and to those planted seeds of Satan. You don't have to. Because you have the fullness of God's word to instruct you as to what is true. And you have the spirit of almighty God living inside of you to strengthen you and to help you to choose what is right instead of choosing the ways of the world. If you do not have Jesus, you can. You do not have to stay stuck in the lie. You don't have to keep doing the things that you have done. You don't have to live in your shame and your guilt and your brokenness because Jesus came and he defeated Satan on the cross by dying as a perfect sacrifice for your sins and rising triumphantly from the grave three days later. Jesus is just waiting for you to respond to his offer of life. Because he's offering you that tree of life again. He's offering you hope and joy and peace. I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to begin speaking to your heart this morning. Because I know that God is faithful to his word and that God is speaking to your hearts. If you're going to be baptized this morning, go ahead and and, and go get changed. But I know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. The prayer team is going to make their way down here to the front. And we're going to enter into a last song of worship. However the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, whatever you need prayer for this morning, I want to invite you to respond to God's word. You do not have to stay a slave to the lies of the enemy. Jesus wants to set you free this morning. I invite you to come and to receive that freedom. Please stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord.